Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, it's good to have everybody in again this afternoon, a beautiful day in Oklahoma. For those of you all across the country, uh, you, you just ought to be in Tulsa today. But if you're not here today and you're ever coming through again sometime, why you stop in and spend the afternoon with us for a taping session. Again, we uh, have some here today that have never been here before. We like to make you feel welcome. And uh, for those of you out in television, this, of course, is just an informal Bible study. We do not trumpet any one group. We don't attack anybody. But uh, we trust we can just open the scriptures and uh, just determine what the word says. In a lot of cases, what it doesn't say. My, how many people have called to tell us that they thought the Bible said such and such, and it doesn't. Okay, and ordinarily we do not advertise things. We leave that up to the announcer at the end. But today they did want me to let the television audience know that we've got more. I'm going to call it a test marketing thing to see how it goes. But we have a computer playable uh, CD which includes the whole King James Bible. It includes our whole question and answer book. It includes the first program back in Genesis and then our documentary, which we call uh, Our Story. And uh, that's going to go out for, what, 10 bucks, honey? And uh, we're just going to see how it flies and if it's something that uh, you out in television can appreciate why we'll have to get geared up to put it in production. All right, for those of you here in the studio, of course, we're ready to go right in to where we left off, and we've finished the book of James in our last taping, and today we're going to start with 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Now, as we discussed way back in our introduction to these little Jewish epistles, all of these are still addressed primarily, not exclusively, but primarily to Jewish believers who had been scattered scattered away from Jerusalem because of the persecution, but always remembering that Jews had already been out there in the Gentile world since about 600 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar took them all captive to Babylon, and then they began to uh, migrate throughout the uh, Medan Persian and the Babylonian and the Greek empires, so that by the time we get to the time of Christ and the Roman Empire, there are Jews living everywhere. And uh, I always tell people, if you doubt that, just go to the book of Acts and you'll notice that every place Paul went, where did he start his ministry? In the synagogue. They were everywhere, see? All right, so we now also, in the midst of, of regular, ordinary Judaism, there are now these Jews, beginning with Christ's earthly ministry, that carried on, of course, after Pentecost, who had become believers that Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah, the Christ. And so they had more or less separated into separate little uh, congregations, even though they were still practicing uh, temple worship. And that's the other point I would like to make. Remember, the temple is still operating. All of this takes place, of course, before 68 AD, when we feel Paul and Peter were martyred, and then the temple is destroyed two years later. So these little Jewish epistles are primarily written then to these Jewish believers who for one reason or another are gathered in little congregations, especially up in Asia Minor and Galatia, which we now call the land of Turkey. Now, of course, there were others, but I think most of these Jews that these little epistles address were in that area of the world. Now, as we showed in the very first introduction to these, all of this is in line with the Old Testament prophetic program. There is not a word of church language in these little epistles. In other words, like I said when I taught Hebrews, you can't take someone into 1 Peter and take them through a Roman road of salvation. It's not in here. There is nothing in here pertaining to the body of Christ. It's not in here. But all of these things are written to Jews who were now facing, according to the Old Testament prophecies, the coming seven years of wrath and vexation. There is no indication that God is going to interrupt that yet. They're still looking for all this to happen. In fact, if you remember when we were introducing all this uh, way, way back now, several months ago, how that all the scriptures spoke of these being the last days, and how all these writers, James and Peter and John and Jude and even the book of Revelation, 
were all written with the idea that this was coming down the pipe in a matter of a few years. And I even went back and, and covered Paul's uh, scriptures concerning the rapture. He included himself. And he says, and when we, see, shall be taken up, and we shall ever be with the Lord. Well, he was expecting that to all happen in his lifetime until you finally get to 2 Timothy, he realizes that the old world is going to keep going and uh, his life is going to be taken. But all of these little epistles, and we'll be pointing it out when we hit those verses, are expecting the tribulation to be coming in just a short period of time, and it's preparing them for the suffering and the persecution that's coming. Now, of course, they're still appropriate, because even though we've now come, as I've said a program or two ago, we've come full circle, and we're right back almost where the world was at the time that these things were taking place, once again, the tribulation is right out in front of us, we feel, and the revived Roman Empire is falling into place in Western Europe faster than you can imagine. And the whole scenario of the world is now getting ready for, again, those final seven years. And I've been stressing my classes here in Oklahoma. Why all of a sudden is the world stressing weapons of mass destruction? Because they're going to be evident in those final seven years. That's how close I think we are when indeed the whole world's population will be destroyed by whatever weapons that man has devised. And I've always said that the end events will be nuclear. I think Zechariah makes that so clear. And now, of course, we realize that it'll probably be weapons of uh, bacteria and chemicals and everything else. But it's all getting the world ready for those final seven years. So. Even though these letters were addressed to Jews living back there in 50, 60 to 65 AD, these letters are still appropriate for the Jewish believers that will be on the scene in the early days of the tribulation. And they again will take comfort from these very same scriptures. I mean, it's just almost beyond human comprehension. And so they still fit just as appropriate today as they did then. And so watch for it in that light, that these Jewish believers are now being prepared for the suffering and the persecution that is coming. Now, lest you wonder what I'm talking about, come back with me before we go into 1 Peter, back to Matthew 24. Come with me back to Matthew 24, where the Lord himself is bringing the disciples up to par on end time events. And Matthew 24, of course, is all tribulation. And remember that the Lord himself knew that it was going to be interrupted by 2,000 years, but nobody else did. The 12 had no idea. The Jewish believers had no idea. And as I've already said, even the Apostle Paul had no idea that there was going to be a 1900 and some year hiatus. All right, but back in Matthew 24, I want you now to look at the words of the Lord Jesus himself. And uh, start at verse 15. Matthew 24, verse 15. You all there? And Jesus is speaking. And he says, when you therefore... Now when he says you, of course, he's talking to these Jews. And so to them he is saying, when you see these things come to pass. See? When you therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Now, the scoffers like to tell us that Daniel is a forgery and that it was written by someone long after it, but the Lord doesn't. I mean, the author of the book himself gives credit to Daniel's prophecy, all right? And he says, now, when you see that which was spoken by Daniel standing in the holy place, which, of course, is the Antichrist, then let them who be in Judea flee to the, house, to the mountains, and so on and so forth. But come down quickly now to verse 21. For then. That's the midpoint of the tribulation, of course. They've already had a, a one-fourth of the world's population is gone. So don't ever let anybody tell you that the true tribulation doesn't begin to the midpoint. The first half, of course, is mild by comparison. But 
Revelation tells us that by the end of the first half, one-fourth of the world's population is already gone. I don't call that a Sunday school picnic by any means. But beginning with the middle, it's going to get tremendously worse until it gets to this place. Verse 21, For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world that goes all the way back to Adam, which includes even the flood, to this time, that is, when he was speaking there at his first advent, nor ever shall be, which means that even the Holocaust, horrible, beyond human description, how those six million Jews lost their life at the hands of not, but even that is going to pale by comparison to these last three and a half years. Now, that's hard to understand, isn't it? That's hard to understand that even something worse than the Holocaust is coming upon this world. Now, I think the reason is that the Holocaust, of course, was limited to Nazi Germany and the death camps and so forth, and World War II, which took a tremendous death toll all around the world. But yet, when this comes in, it's going to be the devastation of the whole human race. In fact, I think... I left the program on our last taping with those verses in Jeremiah where it says that death is going to be so rampant that they won't even be able to bury the dead. There will be no funerals. There will be no graveyard digging. And the bodies will be as dung upon the ground. Now, that's what the world is coming to, whether they want to admit it or not. And, of course, every time I read about weapons of mass destruction, I have to think of these verses. The world is facing God's wrath. Now, it isn't because God is unfair or unloving. He has been extending his grace now for 6,000 years in one way or another. But mankind continues to walk it underfoot until finally, until finally, his wrath will fall. And this is what it will be. All right, so remember now then that the days of the tribulation that were postponed back there at uh, 68, 70 A.D., even though Jerusalem did come under portions of it, you might say, they were destroyed and the temple and all that, yet that was not the tribulation that is still waiting to happen. But the scenario is pretty much the same. All right, so now we can jump back to Peter and get in a little ways anyway, this first half hour. And verse 1 says it just exactly like it is. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now here Peter, of course, is addressing his apostleship to the Jews that are scattered. Now, you know, I've been doing this throughout the little book of James. I'm going to do it with Peter. Now let's go back and compare how Paul puts it. Come back with me to Galatia, uh, Ephesians chapter 3. <clears throat> and here's the difference. See, and this is what we have to understand. You can't just throw it all in the blender and turn it up on high. You have to keep them all separated and just compare one with the other and then note the differences. What a difference. All right, Ephesians chapter 3, right there at verse 1. Just like 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Peter says, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those Jewish strangers. Now look what Paul says in Ephesians 3. Verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner, and of course an apostle, of Jesus Christ for whom? Gentile. See how clearly he puts that? Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. And so Everything that Paul writes from Romans 1.1 1, 1 until the last verse of Philemon is addressed primarily, not exclusively, but primarily to Gentiles, like these little letters are written primarily, not exclusively, to Jews. See the difference? All right, come back to 1 Peter. So now then, he's an apostle of Jesus Christ writing to Jews scattered throughout that uh, part of the Middle East. All right, now verse 2. Elect or chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father 
through the sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience, and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace be unto you. All right, now again let's come back. I should have left you there in the first place. Come back again to Ephesians and see how Paul puts the same kind of a scenario, writing to us Gentiles. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1. Starting at verse 3. Ephesians 1, verse 3. All got it? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies or in heavenly places in Christ. Now here it comes. According as he hath chosen us in him from before the foundations of the world. Now, do you see? What does that tell us? That our almighty omniscient God knew everything before the world was ever created. He knew exactly who would become believers, whether it was in Israel or whether it was in the church age. Nothing was unknown to him. So when Paul says that we who are in Christ were already reckoned as such according to that foreknowledge of God, remember, the foreknowledge of God, it isn't that God picked and chose and said, well, you're going to hell and you're going to heaven. Don't you ever buy that kind of stuff. God has not done that. He has made it possible for every human being. Let me show you a verse back in the Gospels. Come back with me to John's Gospel. And we've used it before, but it's been a long time ago now. John's Gospel, chapter 1, and I think it's verse 9. John's Gospel, Chapter 1, verse 9. Speaking, of course, of Christ and his first advent. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 9. That, speaking of Jesus of Nazareth, that was the true light, capitalized, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. How many? Every last one. No one has ever escaped that light that has been revealed. I don't care if they were the aborigines of Australia or the darkest part of China or Africa or Timbuktu. Every human being has had a light. Consequently, when I'm on that, I've always got to carry it on then to Romans. Consequently, Romans, or Paul can write under inspiration in perfect accord with that. Romans chapter 1. Almost have to start with verse 19. Romans 1 verse 19, in light of the fact that Christ, the light of the world, has lighted everything. Every man, now it's a generic term, that also includes the women, that cometh into the world. All right? Romans chapter 1, verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. That is, the unbelieving world. For God has, past tense, showed it. Oh, don't ask me how, I can't tell you, but the scripture says it has already happened. And he has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. That's been revealed to the whole human race, beginning with Adam and Eve. So that they, the whole human race, are what? Without excuse. Without excuse. In other words, they're going to come before the great white throne bodily. All the lost of all the ages. And they're going to come before him. And they're going to have to admit that they spurned the opportunity that was given. And they won't beg an excuse. They won't have one because they had enough light 
to become believers. And again, I can't comprehend it. I can't understand it. But I believe what the Word says. All right, now then. Again, back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, or verse 2 now. So they were elect, or they became the chosen. They became believers. And God knew it in His foreknowledge. Not that He had picked some to be lost and some to be saved. That was everybody's opportunity, Jew as well as Gentile. But those, of course, who became believers then enter into that position of being the elect. And according to the foreknowledge of God, now back in verse 2, through the sanctification or the setting apart work of the Spirit, unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace. Now, like I said at the beginning, there is no gospel of grace in these, but that doesn't mean that Peter will make no reference now to Christ's death, burial, and his resurrection, and as he does here, his shed blood. Certainly he will, because it's a done deal. It's, it's past. But he does not present that as a means of salvation like Paul does. Now again, I guess I better go back and see what, uh, what I'm talking about. Come all the way back again to Romans. All the way back to Romans. Because I want to show you how clearly these things are not in these little Jewish epistles. You just can't find them. Even though there's a reference to the blood or so forth, but it does not define it like Paul does. And that's where the difference comes in. All right, in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And I like to start with verse 23. Because this is an all-encompassing verse on the lot of mankind. Ever since Adam, we have all sinned. Every one of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now here it comes. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption or the process of buying us back that is in Christ Jesus, verse 25, through faith in His blood. Now, I see Peter just makes reference to it as an accomplished fact, but he doesn't tell us what that blood is really doing with us in our faith relationship. But here Paul tells us that when we've placed our faith in his shed blood, where God has declared his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Now then, verse 26, this is where you and I are. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he, God, up in verse 25, that he might be what? Just, totally fair, without cutting any corners. He can be just, and he will be the justifier of that person that what? Believe it. See? Now, Peter doesn't lay that out there clearly. And then, of course, you go on through Paul's epistles over and over, he makes it how plain the work of the cross then becomes our gospel or our plan of salvation. All right, I'm not going to take time. I was going to stop at 1 Corinthians 15, but we'll, we'll come back to that later. Okay, back to 1 Peter once again. So he's certainly going to make mention of these things that are past, that Christ has died, his blood has been shed, absolutely. All right, now verse 3. 1 Peter 1. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a living hope. A living hope. Why? Because Christ is no longer in the tomb. He's been raised from the dead. But you see, Peter doesn't lay that out as a part and parcel of gospel. He's just laying it out as a fact to be rested upon that even Israel has to understand their Messiah is not dead, he's alive. And you see, Peter does the same thing in uh, Acts 2 and 3. He doesn't associate it with gospel per se, but he lets it be known that the Christ that they crucified was not dead, he was alive, and was still in full uh, capabilities of fulfilling those covenant promises of bringing in that glorious kingdom. All right, so he says we've been begotten unto a living hope because 
Christ is the light. All right, verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. See? And that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. So they're also looking for an eternal existence in God's program because of their faith. Verse 5, you who are kept by the power of God through faith. Now, you know, the question comes up so often. How were the Old Testament people saved? By faith. By faith. It's always been by faith. In fact, we, we showed in, in our uh, teaching up in South Dakota last week. It was cold, but it was nice and warm inside. And uh, we showed that way back, Adam, when he and Eve were restored back to fellowship, why? Because they had taken God at his word. God had told them that they would be the progenitors of the whole human race. And because of that, Adam named the woman the mother of all living. Well, what was that? It was a manifestation of his faith. And so all the way up through the Old Testament, whether it was sacrifices, temple worship, whatever, it was still always precipitated by their faith. Then you come into Christ's earthly ministry. What was the basis for the twelve knowing that Jesus was the promised Messiah? By faith. They believed it because the Word of God had promised such a person would come. And when they saw his signs and wonders and miracles, they believed it. It's always been by faith. Never lose that. In the same way with us in the age of grace, but so also now with these Jews to whom Peter, James, and John are writing these little epistles. It's always by faith. All right, now let's go on into verse 6 in the moment we have left. And so, no, verse 5 who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the what? The last time. Well, what's the last time? These final seven years of human history, which would lead up to the coming of their Messiah to set up his kingdom. So watch for this. Every once in a while you have this reference that this is bringing us to the end of the human experiment that the kingdom would be coming in, and from there, of course, we'd be ushered into eternity. There is no inkling that all this is going to be interrupted and filled with what we now call 1900 years of the church age. So, he says, all these things will be revealed in the last time. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.